Can you please take seat? Vedete? Lo vediamo ma c'è davanti una... A social dinner um, that we can add and, uh, and accompanying people are free. Free? No, they have to pay. But we have space also for the accompanying people, if there are. Okay? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Beta. So we start this second session with another remote talk by Silvia Bonoli that will uh, talk us about uh, modeling black holes over a wide range of scales. So, Silvia, you have 12 minutes. I give you a three minutes warning. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, so, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah, I think, yeah, thank you. So, well, first of all, I'm very sorry for not being there. Um, last minute family issues. But uh, a big thanks to Paolo, Beta, and all the other organizers. Paolo, Beta, and all the other organizers for making the, you know, for quickly organizing also remote participation. So yes, today I'll just briefly talk about uh, what, uh, you know, there are a few people working on this, uh, how to model black holes across a wide range of uh, scales, physical, Rashi scale, like uh, time scales, uh, physical scales, and also mass scales. Um, so before I get into that, uh, I just, uh, let me see, I cannot change the light. Uh, okay, somehow it got stuck. Ah. Okay, can you see now? Yeah, I hope it yes. changed. Anyway, I continue, yes. So um, just a brief advertisement. Um, um, since 2018, my institute, where, where I am now, opened a new line in astrophysics, and that's actually why I went there. Um, it's uh, in San Sebastian, Spain, in the Basque Country. Um, it's called Donostia International Physics Center, and I hope many of you will come visit at some point in the future. And in particular, I want to advertise two meetings that are relevant for this audience. Um, one that is taking place in September on uh, black holes in dwarf galaxies. And the second one, uh, which we're organizing for mid-October, is the Young AGN, Young Astronomer on Galactic Nuclei meeting uh, for students and postdoc working on AGN. So if you are interested in any of these meetings, it would be great to see many of you there. Okay, so let me start, uh, uh, well, a, a little bit of motivation. Um, this is a compilation, of course not complete, of very large projects that uh, currently or in the near future are gonna, or far future actually, some of them, <laughs> not um, the next 10 years or so, um, that are observing or will observe uh, a large number of uh, accreting black holes or merging black holes. Uh, you know, from X-rays to radio, and even these new multi-messengers uh, with gravitational wave detection. Um, so they will deliver a lot of new data on, the, on, on, on black holes uh, across, uh, you know, many, many different redshift, 
and, uh, and black holes of different masses, from supermassive to intermediate mass black holes. So to interpret the data coming from all these surveys, uh, we need, you know, relatively solid models that can allow you to, you know, to study really how um, different prediction for the physics of that, uh, the physics that drive black hole evolution, how they affect the observables of all these, uh, of all these experiments. So um, the goal of this work uh, um, is to buy a f uh, to build um, a flexible framework to study all the processes that drive black hole evolution, the formation and evolution of supermassive black holes, starting from the seeds to the quasar scales, and also how all these processes, how black holes also are linked to, to galaxies and the large scale structure in general. Now, the main problem is uh, here we face is that the, um, you know, to build this, we need to model an extreme wide range of masses, physical and also time scales, right? Just an example below, we have on the left, like a snapshot of a simulation. What we want to do is to model galaxies that live inside the dark matter halo. And then within galaxies, we have uh, our uh, uh, supermassive black hole at the center, right? So this, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, physical scale, we go from uh, tens, hundreds of megaparsec going down to like subparsec scales. And also in terms of mass and time scales, right? Like if, uh, I don't know if you um, see my courses, but anyway, the, the first black holes were formed uh, certainly above redshift, uh, you know, above redshift eight or 10, and they um, possibly range, uh, uh, started with a wide range of masses from population three, the remnants of the first, uh, so above three seeds, the remnant of the first massive stars, to direct collapse black holes from uh, the uh, collapse of uh, metal-free gas, and other, there are other scenarios for very massive seeds. Um, then these evolved in time down to the present universe, all these black holes grew, merged, and had this all exciting and uh, complicated life down to the black holes, supermassive black holes that we see today, and also the intermediate mass black holes, which are also still very interesting to, you know, uh, we, we start knowing much more about about these objects in uh, uh, in the we start in the last few years and more and more will be discovered with these new with these new facilities. So what our goal is to you know to build a model to um, uh, you know to try to model uh, all the physics that uh, is important for black hole evolution and we want to link it to dark matter. So uh, the baseline for our model is the L galaxies model for galaxy formation. This is a model that links galaxy evolution to dark matter merger trees. So you have a simulation, dark matter simulation, and then you follow the evolution of the baryonic component of the universe that thanks to physically motivated assumption. This is a model that has been used uh, in the last more than 10, 15 years has been uh, you know, developed by many people and has been very successful in the description of uh, the evolution of galaxies. And uh, it relies on, it can run on different kinds of dark matter simulations and each of them uh, you know, uh, is useful to study a particular kind of, uh, of, of environment or galaxy. Uh, or black holes, right? So, for example, we have a smaller simulations that have higher resolution that can be used to study dwarf galaxies and intermediate mass black holes to the most to the largest volume simulations that can be used to study the brightest quasars and clusters. And we are developing a new simulation to trace the first uh, forming, uh, the first collapsing dark matter halos where the first galaxies form, where this population three remnant seeds. Uh, could have, uh, uh, could have developed and then grew to uh, supermassive black holes. So we want to model, so uh, we, we have now a, a, you know, a, a tool to go from dark matter to galaxies, but what we want is to actually also model all the evolution of black holes. So there are many things we want to include in all this modeling. We want to model different seeding scenarios, the evolution of black hole spins, different channels for accretion, for gas accretion through merger, uh, secular processes. Um, want to model in particular for gravitational wave experiments, to, uh, for prediction for gravitational wave experiment, we want to model the evolution of binary black hole um, or even uh, triplets, uh, 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 so three body, uh, the evolution of a, a three body system want to track also the evolution of orphan black holes, like black holes that somehow are lost, they are wandering in the outskirts of galaxies, and also nuclear star cluster to also see how black holes interact with, uh, with the clusters, uh, with the stellar clusters at the, at the center of galaxies. 
So I don't have time to get into much details, so just very quickly fleshing out a few results we got so far. Um, so Daniel Espinoso, student uh, that actually now finished the PhD, um, he has been working on modeling the first phases of black hole formation and modeling all, uh, you know, all uh, uh, indigenous so far channel for black hole formation from population three remnants to the runaway collapse of dense stellar cluster, the direct collapse of large gas clouds, and also the formation of seeds during the merger of gas-rich galaxies. So uh, to model all these uh, uh, at the, with the current simulations we have available, uh, we cannot model population tree cell consistency, but we are using as input in our simulation um, the outputs of other, uh, of other runs uh, from Rosa Valiante, the group of Rome, Rosa Valiante, of uh, Rafaela Schneider, and also I think uh, um, there will be a talk on this uh, um, uh, on, uh, in, a, in a few days by uh, Alessandro Trinca. And also, but in the Millennium too, we can model more massive seeds self-consistently using uh, so the simulations we have available. So what we did is try to model the conditions in which these first black holes could have formed. Um, so this is an example of how our simulation looks like in the environment of the first formed uh, direct collapse, uh, an example of a direct collapse black hole. This is a map of the uh, a dark matter density, mass density. Uh, this is for an environment of a runaway stellar merger. As you can see, it's a very, very different environment. We find that direct collapse black hole form in the densest environments where there is, uh, you know, many, many galaxies in a, in a, gro a group or cluster. We also find that light seeds, the one, the remnant of population three stars are the one that do ones that dominate the non black hole number density, but, but also the total mass budget. Um, another, uh, in another work, we analyze what is, uh, you know, the role of different channels for black hole accretion. We looked at galaxy, you know, the role of galaxy mergers in uh, uh, feeding the black hole or other secular processes like disk instabilities. These are predictions for the black hole mass function and the luminosity function, the, the bolometric luminosity function. And also, we study the environment of, bl of black holes, uh, uh, active black holes um, of uh, living in different kinds of galaxies. So, for example, the, the, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at very high redshift, uh, the most active black holes are the one in, in pseudo bulges. Um, so, and uh, so ga galaxies that have a bulge component that experience a lot of disk instability, violent disk instabilities. And uh, at lower redshift, uh, most of active black holes are actually in, in more classical bulges. Two minutes. Yeah, thanks. So we also study, you know, we model black hole spin evolution, finding that somehow to reproduce what has been observed in, in, uh, in, for, for uh, luminous X-ray sources, the high spin observed for um, luminous X-ray sources, to reproduce that, we need to link somehow the um, the evolution of the spin of the black holes to the morphology or the, let's say, the ordered motion of the, the order of the motion uh, of, sorry, the, uh, uh, the, um, the dynamics of the gas that could be arriving, that, that arrives to the black hole during accretion. So again, we find that the most, uh, uh, the highest uh, spinning black holes are the one living in pseudo bulges while elliptical galaxies are hosting black holes that, have, that are slowly spinning. Uh, the last results I, I just flesh out is uh, an interesting effect that we found when we actually model the recoil. Um, so this is uh, when the recoil is the ejection of, uh, of, a, of a black hole that just experienced a merger. Uh, the gravitational recoil effectively ejects the black hole from the center of the galaxy and then the black hole eventually can return. Uh, in a time scale that depends on the, on, the, on the properties of the host galaxy. But what we find is that because, uh, in particular, in, again, in pseudobulges, uh, black holes are easily ejected because of the properties also of the spin and other properties of the galaxy, they live quite some time away from the center, they cannot accrete, so they are actually uh, living below, they are not following the scaling relation that is observed for uh, classical bulges, but they're actually uh, these black holes are under massive with respect to classical bulges and elliptical. So just finish up, uh, just, uh, you know, just wanted to show that uh, we are building this framework to study 
how different uh, physical processes shape the formation and evolution of supermassive black holes in a cosmological context to, uh, with the final goal actually of generating prediction for the next generation of instruments. And um, yeah, in particular, actually, we, 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 are, we are soon uh, also getting out some results in which we are studying the host galaxy properties of uh, uh, Athena and, uh, and Lisa and a PTA uh, events uh, uh, observed the black holes. And uh, thanks a lot, and I hope uh, to see many of you in San Sebastian in, in, in the fall. Thanks, Silvia. Down we there. have a question from Roberto De Carli down there. Can you hear me? No, no uh, yes. So, very nice talk. I had a quick question. If I understood correctly, you typically find that uh, black holes in elliptical galaxies don't, be, don't uh, tend to be very fast rotating. And I was wondering how you reconcile that with the classical uh, radio galaxy picture of uh, the jet uh, in, uh, in hosted in typically elliptical galaxies. Could you hear the question? Nothing. Nothing, okay. So Roberto was asking he, 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 that in your simulations, the black holes are not fastly rotating, and he's, he's wondering if this has consequences on the classical picture of radio jet uh, um, acceleration, right? More or less. The, <laughs> I'm not sure I, I fully understand. Can you, is it working now the microphone? No. Okay, now it's working. Can you repeat it for, uh, quickly because- I mean, we don't, model, we don't model radio jet here, eh? Okay. It, uh, other questions, there is another question there. You, I, th I guess Roberto will email you with these questions because maybe we okay, I couldn't thanks. hear from the from the. Okay. I'll wait for the email, Robert. Hi. Um, can, can you tell your name so uh, so that the speakers yeah. know who is speaking? I am Giovanni Mazzolari, and I want to ask: um, How is implementing the seeding mechanism, and in particular the mass of the seed black holes? Sorry, I couldn't hear either. This is simple to, to repeat. <laughs> this is working. So how is implemented the seeding mechanism and in particular the mass of the seed black holes? Sorry, can you repeat once more? So far. Ah, okay. Sorry. How is implemented the seeding mechanism and in particular, in L galaxies, how is implemented the mass of the seed black holes? So, okay, let me see if I understood right. How we implement the mass of the seeds? How we choose the mass of the seeds? Yeah, okay, so it's, um, we try to, to model uh, different scenarios, so that depends on the local condition of the galaxies. So, for example, if, um, uh, so for, for now, we cannot model self-consistently population tree remnants because we don't have the resolution for that. It's something that we plan to do in the future. For now, we only have that. So we, we inherit population tree from other simulation, which we take a starting point. But not all galaxies have a population tree remnant. So if there is not a pop tree remnant in a, in a new galaxy in the simulation, then uh, we see the local condition. So if the condition of the environment are such that uh, the gas, for example, is metal free and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and there is enough uh, um, lyman werner flux around to dissociate uh, H2 cooling, then we form a massive seed of uh, 10, to the, uh, 10 to the 5 solar masses. So somehow the initial mass depends on the condition that uh, of the of the local condition of the environment that could satisfy one seeding scenario over another one. Okay. Okay. So thanks, Silvia. Uh, we Thank go you. on to the next speaker. So the next speaker is Marika Lepore. Okay.
Where is the presentation mode here? Full screen mode. Here, yeah, here we go. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marika Lebore, and today I'm going to talk to you about the mass assembly and AGN activity in the Galaxy Cluster XDCP0044. So, uh, models and simulations suggest a scenario in which uh, galaxy major mergers induce starburst and fuel black holes accretion, triggering an AGN phase. And later, the feedback phase of an AGN may be responsible for quenching star formation and uh, lead to the formation of a passive elliptical galaxy. And the ideal laboratories to study these processes are galaxy cluster, which show different properties at different redshift. Particularly on one end, in the local universe, we can say that cluster scores are populated mainly by elliptical galaxies, and among them we can find the brightest cluster galaxy, that is a red elliptical massive and luminous galaxy. On the other end, high redshift cluster cores are mainly populated by star-forming galaxies, and we cannot observe the presence of a brightest cluster galaxy. Particularly a redshift between one and two, we can observe a, an inversion of star formation density relation, and this suggests that population inside clusters undergo one or more processes able to affect star formation and AGN activity. Unfortunately, to date, it is not clear yet how these processes influence galaxy uh, evolution and also AGN evolution. So for this reason, we focused on the analysis of a region inside the galaxy cluster XDCP0044 that is the most massive and densest galaxy cluster known at redshift 1.6, and it shows diffuse X-ray emission due to the presence of the intercluster medium and also five X-ray point-like emission, two of which confirm cluster members, and we can see that they are named three, that is the one analyzed in our work, and five, that is the one in the core region analyzed by Andrea Travascio and collaborators, which is dominated by star-forming and active galaxies. Also, this cluster shows an inversion of star formation density relation, Indeed, Santos and collaborators found that the star formation rate in the cluster core is four times higher with respect to star formation rate in the cluster outskirts. So in our work, we use high-resolution HST images in three different infrared bands combined with KMOS IFU data in two different infrared bands with Chandra X-ray data in order to study star formation and nuclear activity around the X-ray point like source 3 that in our work is named M1. So from high resolution HST images, we found that the region of 24 kiloparsec time 24 kiloparsec is populated by uh, nine sources, up to nine sources and we were able to calculate fluxes and magnitudes of these sources using HST images. Then we focused on uh, infrared, uh, near-infrared diffuse spectroscopy. Particularly, we analyzed the spectra of the six sources inside the chemos fields of view, and we found that they show the presence of a narrow H-alpha emission line, with the exception of M1, which show also the presence of a broad H-alpha emission line. From the narrow line, we were able to calculate the redshift of these sources, confirming that they are cluster members. And also, using the redshift, we were able to divide these six sources in two different subgroups, complex M and complex N, which are formed by three different sources that will merge on a time scale of 10 to 30 mega years. 
Also, using IFU spectroscopy, we were able to perform, uh, to create two different velocity shift map of the entire emission of the narrow H alpha emission, emission line. Particularly on the left, we can see the velocity shift map of the emission of the single sources, while on the right, we have the emission map of the diffuse emission of the H alpha uh, narrow line. And as we can see, complex M and complex N are approaching each other with a velocity shift of 300 km per second. And they are at a projected distance of 13 kiloparsec. So we have that they will merge on a time scale of almost 400 mega years. Also, we can observe some emission, some diffuse emission below M1 and between N3 and N3 and M1, and this could be the stabilized gas due to the presence of ongoing mergers. Analysis of the source M1. Which show the presence of a broad H alpha emission line, and it could be classified as a broad line AGN. And from the full width at alpha maximum and the luminosity of this line, we were able to calculate some properties of this AGN, such as the central black hole mass, bolometric and Eddington luminosity, and Eddington ratio. And we can say that from our results, uh, M1 hosts a medium size but moderately accreting black hole with a Eddington ratio of 0 0.2. Then we focus on the analysis of the X-ray data uh, associated with this source and we fitted the spectrum with a three component model, a power law, a terms that accounts for intrinsic absorption, and a terms that accounts for galactic absorption. And from our results, we can say that the photon index is between 1.8 and 2, so we are observing a type 1 AGN, and also this AGN is relatively luminous with a luminosity of 10 to the 43 erg per second, and also slightly obscured with a column density of 10 to the 22 centimeter to the minus two. At the end of our work, we analyze the X-ray image of the entire cluster. And in 2014, Paolo Dozzi and collaborators found that this cluster showed the presence of an irregular surface brightness and it could be divided into two different clumps with different temperatures, the north clump and the south clump. As we can see from the image, the north clump that is associated with the cluster core is brighter than the rest of the cluster, and the south clump has a lower surface brightness, and there is also a bright arc overlapping these two clumps. So we fitted this image with a double bidimensional beta model in order to, found, to find the X-ray emission peaks. And we found that the first peak is associated to cluster core, while the other, the other one is shifted with respect to uh, the region analyzed in our work. But we argue that we are observing uh, two comparable halos with their forming BCG that are merging and will merge on a time scale of almost six giga years. But unfortunately, our data are not able to uh, describe completely the, the complex dynamical state of this cluster. So we submitted an ALMA proposal with Luca Di Mascolo SPI in order to obtain high resolution uh, Tsunayev Zeldovich imaging for due to the presence of the ICM in this cluster. So as an immediate result, we can say that we are observing the formation site of a second BCG inside, inside the galaxy cluster XDCP0044, and also our results are in agreement with the scenario in which galaxy major mergers trigger AGN uh, evolution and also uh, starburst activity. So in order to reach a comprehensive description of uh, uh, galaxy evolution and also AGN evolution with respect to the environment, we need to observe several of these objects. 
with a multi-wavelength approach. So as a first step, we submitted two different Chandra proposal in order to observe six different protoclusters. The first one to observe four different protoclusters in uh, the redshift range from 1.9 to 2.5, and the second one to observe two different protoclusters with redshift 2.2. So we can say that, unfortunately, the uh, loss of sensitivity of Chandra makes it impossible to go deeper in the X-ray band. But using deeper infrared uh, integral field spectroscopy combined with uh, James Webb Space Telescope, we may provide further insight into the evolution of uh, uh, massive galaxies at high redshift and also to the dynamical states of galaxy clusters. That's it. Thanks for your attention. Thanks, Marika. Any questions from the audience? So I, 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 so I, I, I. Uh, what relation has been used to measure the black hole mass? and O, so the one that used the full width at alpha maximum of the H-alpha emission line and also the luminosity of the H-alpha emission line. We did not take into account the extinction. So thanks, uh, Mark, again. <laughs> so we move to the next speaker, that is Elena de la Bontà from Padova, uh, that will talk about uh, driving black hole masses. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here because I have also a three-dimensional view of the participants that I was really missing. Okay, let me try to... Okay, so hello everybody. Um, I would like to discuss uh, with you today about uh, how we can measure black hole masses in uh, distance quasars and AGN. And uh, for uh, quasars, and quasars and AGN that are really this distance, we are not able to direct measure the black hole mass. And to do that, we need to use the scaling relationships that are based on the direct method that is a reverberation mapping that uh, have been uh, derived locally with uh, uh, nearby AGN, and usually also bright AGNs. But uh, the problem is that these uh, scaling relationships are often used uh, not in the right way, and uh, also all the parameters that are used also in the reverberation mapping uh, um, product uh, are not uh, uh, trivial to use. So you have to pay attention of the number we put in the, in the equation. So this is what I'm going to discuss uh, with you today. So and I will uh, uh, give you an empirical formula to derive black hole masses uh, with the state to the art, to the art data. Uh, if we consider the reverberation mapping technique, we uh, look uh, at the emission line variations that follow those in the continuum with uh, um, a time delay that, is, uh, um, that goes up to um, a certain number of days. And this uh, delay is due to the light travel time across uh, the line emitting region. So when uh, we consider the, uh, the lag between uh, the emission line uh, um, uh, light curve and the continuum light curve, uh, we derive uh, a cross correlation function, and from that uh, we get uh, the measure of the, of the lag. And uh, uh, what we use to measure the black hole mass is an is, uh, equation that is actually quite simple. Uh, we have uh, on the, um, uh, the, this, 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 the named birial product, that is uh, of uh, units of mass, where there are two observables in it. So we have the radius of the borderline region that uh, is uh, found through the lag, so through regression mapping. And then there is also the emission line width. The factor F is uh, an, uh, a factor that is uh, 
set uh, essentially from, uh, uh, by the geometry and the inclination of the system, but uh, inside there we put everything we actually don't know about the, the AGN. We can uh, uh, either measure uh, the a factor F by computing an ensemble of average of, uh, of the values, uh, if we are able to get the measurements of the black hole mass with different techniques, uh, or what we usually do is uh, to assume the same zero point of the M-sigma relation for uh, AGN and local, local quiescent galaxies. Uh, but uh, the main question is uh, what kind of emission line we do we put uh, in, uh, in here? And uh, what is the right number that we have uh, to use? Uh, okay. Um, when uh, we uh, use uh, line widths, uh, we prefer uh, to use the root main square residual spectrum. So in a regression mapping campaign, ideally we take a different spectra, uh, ideally every night, uh, and uh, then we just can compute uh, the root main square. So we compute the mean and then the root main square spectrum. And from that, uh, we can measure the line width. Uh, and uh, doing that, we are able to get rid of the cast constant features. And uh, we are also able, uh, especially, to get uh, the velocity dispersion of the gas that actually is responding to the continuum variation. Uh, but uh, uh, on doing that, uh, we can see that uh, we can find uh, uh, both the measurements of the uh, width as a full width at half maximum or uh, the line dispersion has the second moment, the root square of the second moment of the line profile. And uh, usually, no, it's not usually, but uh, very often we can, uh, we see that uh, we can uh, either, that people think that we can either use the full width or uh, the sigma line just by using the factor to uh, go from one to the, to the other. But actually this is incorrect. So this could be in principle uh, ideally correct if we had the Gaussian profile. So we are really talking about fitting the line profile, but uh, we know that in general uh, the profiles are not Gaussian. And, uh, uh, here we can, we can see on the, uh, on the top right uh, two extreme examples where the, um, the ratio between the full width at half maximum and the sigma line is not constant. So we cannot really measure either one quantity or the other and think that we can get uh, reliable and uh, great uh, um, measure uh, masses of, uh, of the black holes. So we have to pay real attention on, uh, on, uh, on the, the, the numbers we put in the equation. And uh, there are, uh, um, so the main question to, to motivate us uh, and to understand why, why we have been doing this, uh, this work is, uh, what should we use? Should we use sigma or a full width at half maximum? Well, there are different uh, and several uh, uh, evidences that uh, uh, prove that the, the sigma of the line profile is much better than the full width at half maximum. So we can have uh, uh, a better VDR relationship. And, uh, and that is uh, even closer to the predicted slope, uh, and we have a, a, a less intrinsic scatter. We have also a better agreement between uh, the masses uh, derived from the H beta emission line or the carbon-4 emission lines. Uh, and there is also the uh, elimination of the problem of the subending tone limit that appeared to be present in the past, but it was due to measurements of full width at half maximum, line width, and not uh, sigma. And uh, there are also more recent results uh, uh, by Williams and collaborators uh, a couple of years ago that uh, by using uh, some uh, uh, modeling, uh, they, uh, they conclude that uh, the sigma is uh, better than the full width at half maximum on the measurements of the line widths. Um, the, the problem of uh, full width at half maximum and the, and the sigma is that uh, we often uh, don't deal with very nice data because of signal to noise problems, because of uh, very uh, far uh, objects are not very bright. And so measuring the sigma of the line actually is very, very complicated. So what we are going to do is uh, to provide you a correction so that if you are not able to get sigma, you can get full width, but we, we can give you a correction for that uh, with a penalty of uh, paying for some uh, more scatter in the relation, but you can, uh, you can go to the end uh, to uh, reach uh, the uh, result with the reliable black hole masses. Um, thanks to regression mapping, we, uh, there was uh, 
this uh, very, very tight relation between the radius of the broadland region and the luminosity of the AGN that is measured at the uh, 5100 Anstrom, the continuum. And uh, this is a very, very tight relation. And uh, uh, thanks to this one, um, this relation is able to open uh, the um, the, to open us to the possibility to have uh, a secondary technique uh, so that uh, we are able to measure black hole masses in principle just by taking one single spectrum. So by taking the uh, line width of the, of the H beta emission line in, in this case uh, and uh, from the measurement of the continuum at 5100 we can get uh, the measurement of the leg uh, and then we are able to get the black hole mass. But uh, there is uh, a not very uh, straightforward uh, issue to deal with, that is uh, that this uh, continuum luminosity have uh, to be, um, um, have a, uh, from this continuum luminosity, we have to subtract uh, the contribution of the AGN itself. So uh, it's not uh, a very straightforward way to do that. In principle, that we would need uh, HST imaging, so high resolution imaging, so that we can uh, take into account also the starlight contribution of the host of the AGN. But uh, there is uh, another relation that is uh, known since uh, a few years ago, that is uh, a relation very tight between the AGN continuum luminosity and the, uh, the H beta luminosity of the broad component. Uh, so it was found uh, many years ago and more recently by Dragon Lilik in, uh, a few years ago. And uh, what we did is uh, to uh, confirm this uh, tight relation. So we used uh, the uh, best uh, catalog of uh, Revelation mapping uh, um, masses of black, hole ma of, of black holes. And uh, uh, we were able to see actually that the relation is very, very tight. And in the measurements of uh, the relation between the continuum luminosity or the H broad uh, luminosity and the, and the leg, we, we don't have a loss of precision. So the relation is as tight as the one of the continuum. But we don't have to deal with the star contribution of, uh, of the AGN. Thanks to this, we were able also to uh, go ahead by using also a catalog of uh, the, the best available uh, database of uh, regression mapping mass masses and also data from uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey regression mapping project. And uh, we were able to see also that it's possible to get uh, single hypospectral masses estimates thanks also to this uh, radius luminosity relation for carbon-4. Um, as uh, the line width, uh, we also show that we can use uh, the, the velocity disper the, the dispersion of the line width uh, um, in the mean spectrum or in the single hypospectrum or the full width at, at half maximums uh, at the proxies for the sigma uh, derived in the root mean square spectrum. So for H beta, we can use both uh, the, the, the sigma in the, in the single hypospectrum or the full width at half maximum. And for carbon-4, we see that we can use only the sigma, but the full, we can use also the full width at half maximum, but with a much higher scatter. So we have to take into account of this one when we get the final measurement of the mass. And uh, one thing we have uh, been providing, and we are still working on to refine that, uh, is uh, the uh, empirical formula to get the black hole mass of... Uh, um, by using single hypospectra. Uh, so if uh, we initially use uh, only the equation uh, by using the, the relation between radius luminosity and relation between uh, full width at half maximum and uh, velocity dispersion, uh, we see that uh, the, the, re the relation between the masses uh, found through revelation mapping and the mass into the uh, single hypospectra me uh, method uh, are not... Uh, um, uh, consistent very well, uh, but we had uh, to apply a correction because we found uh, a third. Oops, oh gosh. We found uh, a third parameter, so we found that uh, the, um, there is also a dependence of the, on the adding tone ratio. And we confirmed that because it was already seen uh, a few years ago. We did the same also for the carbon four. 
so we were able to uh, provide also an empirical formula. And uh, more recently, we are uh, uh, working and extending everything on, a, 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 on the highest uh, get catalog possible. Uh, we are also trying to see whether there are uh, different measurements that are easy to detect for, uh, to calculate for the line widths. And we also uh, try to see what happens for the mean absolute deviation of the, with the interpercentile inter, inter uh, uh, <laughs> interpercentile velocity, and we actually saw that uh, they are very good to measure the black hole masses. And uh, um, so I just uh, want to give you some conclusions that uh, uh, don't think that is a trivial just to, uh, to use an equation, so we have to pay careful attention on the adopted values uh, entering the real product. Uh, we saw that the luminosity of the Bro component is an excellent proxy uh, for the AGN continuum luminosity. And we are providing also empirical formula for uh, uh, deriving the black hole masses both with H beta and carbon-4 emission lines. And then we are also working on uh, investigating mode with extending uh, also with uh, all other targets that have been observed uh, in, the, um, in six years with the Zloan Digital Sky Survey. And uh, we are also going to use Javelin in all our spectra to have a more homogeneous set of data. So I thank you and uh, stay tuned with the new results coming. Elena. Any questions for Elena? Uh, any questions for Elena? Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, I would like to ask uh, you uh, mm, that, uh, uh, well, uh, um, you know that uh, um, when you go to high identity ratio sources, the line profile of which we tend to become more and more Lorentzian like. With very very uh, strong winds that make uh, well the determination of the sigma uh, more uh, difficult and more prone to errors. Uh, do you take this into account? Thank you, Paula. This is a good point. Uh, actually, we, we want to investigate also this uh, with uh, the Lorentzian shape uh, and uh, try to see whether the, it makes some differences also on. Uh, considering different beings in redshift uh, on, uh, on the masses that have been derived. So it is a good point. Thank you. There is time for another very quick question. <laughs> Fabio. <laughs> Fabio. <laughs> if the third parameter is the Eddington ratio, as the Eddington ratio is the ratio between the luminosity and the black hole mass, does not imply that the relationship of the uh, broad size of the broad line region doesn't, doesn't go with the square root of the luminosity? So is, there is a dependent uh, ad interaction is luminosity divided by the mass. So uh, you, the virial estimate in which you use the square root of luminosity is no longer square root of luminosity, but something different of the slope of square root. Yes, simply. I agree with that, uh, but we certainly need to investigate more on that. Uh, um, I think there is also a problem dealing with the spectral energy distribution, so that it seems uh, that uh, for a higher red ratio, we have a continuum that is software, softer, so with uh, um, low energy in general, and I think that we, we needed to figure out exactly what is going on on that. And this is why we, we are providing a, an empirical formula, because if we try to do that by using the, uh, the virial product itself, uh, we, we get to the same conclusion you, you, you arrived to. Yeah. So thanks, Helen, again. We move on to Federico Lelli, more black hole masses, this time with Alma. Thank you, Giacomo. Can I have the pointer? Yes, it's there. Ah. You can also change the slide. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. In this talk, I'm going to show you that molecular gas dynamics from Alma is really a fantastic tool to measure black hole masses and study AGN feeding in nearby galaxies. So this work is in collaboration with the wisdom so team work is in collaboration here, the with the wisdom team that you can see here. The PIs are Tim Davis in Cardiff and Martin Bureau in Oxford. Ilaria Rufa is actually in this room over there and she's the agent expert in the, in the team. So if you have nasty agent questions, ask her, not me. 
uh, WISDOM stands for Millimeter Wave Interfer Interferometric Survey of Dark Object Masses. Essentially, this is an ALMAS CO survey of early type galaxies, late type galaxies, and even dwarfs. We have 35 objects so far, but we are working in increasing the sample at every ALMA cycle. And the key of wisdom is that we get data at very high spatial resolution, typically between 10 and 80 parsec, in order to reach the sphere of influence of the supermassive black hole. So the primary goal is to, oh, no. OK. The primary goal is to measure the black hole mass. And there are 10 publications on this subject already. There is also a secondary goal that we can achieve with this data, which is, this seems to be terribly slow. Um, what if I do it like this? Okay, which is to study the ISM and the giant molecular clouds, and there are two publications on this topic. Of course, in this talk, I will focus on black hole masses, so let me show you how this works. This is a nearby lenticular galaxy at 70 megaparsec called NGC 383. Some of you may be familiar with it because it has a radial out AGN with jets. This is actually an SDSS image. And if we zoom into the nuclear region using HST, you can see this beautiful disk of dust. And the dust coincide with the CO2 to 1 emission that you can see in blue. These are data with an angular resolution of 40 parts sec. And remarkably, when we look at the kinematics, it's extremely regular, very regular rotation. And in the central parts, you can see this very strong velocity gradient, which is the dynamical signature of the black hole. The best way to look at this, actually, is to take a PV diagram, position velocity diagram, where the x-axis is the distance along this slit, and the y-axis is the line of sight velocity. So you can see that there are two nice and symmetric peaks and then a decline. This is the Keplerian motion of gas orbiting around the black hole. So the next step is to perform a full dynamical modeling. An important point is that with molecular gas, the ratio between the rotation velocity and the velocity dispersion is always much larger than one. And so these are dynamically cold disks in which the rotation velocity is a direct tracer of the equilibrium gravitational potential. In other words, we don't have to take into account pressure support unlike stellar kinematics and in some cases also ionized gas kinematics. So it's much simpler in terms of dynamics. And the only thing that we need to do is to compute the gravitational potential from the stars, the gas, and the black hole. In principle, we can also add a dark matter halo, but this is typically strongly subdominant in the nuclear parts of massive galaxies. And then we can make a fit to the CO cube using uh, several softwares, for example, KinMS from Tim Davis or 3D Barolo from Di Teodoro and Fraternali. This is an example of the application of this method. You can see a PV diagram. The data are in orange. In cyan is a model with no black hole, and so you see that it's terrible. It doesn't reproduce the data at all. This is a model with a black hole mass of 4 times 10 to the 9, which is actually the best fit model for this galaxy. And on the right, it's a model in which there is a black hole, but there are no stars, which is, of course, unphysical, but it's just to show you that to explain the full kinematic behavior of the disk, you need both stars and black hole. Now, this technique has been applied so far to six passive early type galaxies providing black hole masses with errors between 10 to 20 percent, which is fantastic. But actually, in this talk, I want to focus on two special objects in which we have less accuracy, but they are very interesting galaxies. So on the left, you can see NGC 404, which is a dwarf galaxy at 3 megaparsec. And on the right is Feral 49, which is a Seifert around 90 megaparsec. So let me start from the dwarf galaxy. This is thought to be a re rejuvenated dwarf lenticular because the, op the stellar component of the galaxy, which is this black blob there, is surrounded by an extended ring of H1, which is rotating 
and is also forming stars. This is not very visible with the projector, but these are blue knots uh, coming from Galax UV emission. So there is ongoing star formation, uh, giving a total of 0 0.004 solar masses per year, which is sort of typical for a dwarf, and the stellar mass is around 10 to the 9. So if we now zoom in into the very nuclear parts, this is an HST image that show dust lanes around the central nucleus, and this is the ALMA CO2 to 1 map, and I want to point out that this has a resolution of 0.8 parsec, so it's fantastic. Uh, the CO distribution is complex, as well as the kinematics. This is the velocity field, is essentially a mess, these are probably gas streamers falling towards the center. But if you look closely in the very inner parts, there is a rotating disk. So let me zoom in. These are now data at 0.5 parsec. And these are the data. This is our best fit model. These are the residual, which are essentially just a few kilometers per second. And so we get a black hole mass of the order of 5 times 10 to the 5 solar masses that you may consider an intermediate mass black hole. Now let's move to Fire 49. This object has a stellar mass of the order of 10 to the 10, but is extremely bright in the far infrared with a luminosity of 10 to the 11. So it may be considered as a luminous infrared galaxy, a LIRG. It has also a Seifert nucleus, and we estimate approximately a star formation rate of 16 uh, solar masses per year. So it means that probably the central AGN is coexisting with a starburst. On the right, you see the same image but now with a different color stretching to focus better on the outer parts. So there is a spheroidal component, which is a bit complex. There are shells and knots. So this is probably uh, a past merger. And in Cyan is the uh, CO2 to 1 distribution from ALMA. So let's look more closely at the molecular gas. There are these two outer tails or spider arms. We cannot really tell what they are. But remarkably, the gas kinematics is extremely regular uh, in the inner parts. So this is very surprising to me, because this object has a very bright AGN and a starburst, but essentially the cold gas doesn't care. Next, we can perform a full dynamical modeling. So this is, again, a position velocity diagram along the major axis. Uh, gray is the data. Red is our best fit model. And the yellow points represents our best fit rotation curve. This is the observed velocity field. Of course, we model only the inner parts, not the outer tails. And the residuals are, again, of the order of tens of kilometers to second. Here I'm showing also the minor axis. The, so the PV diagram along the minor axis, so along this direction. Because the minor axis is sensitive to radial motions in the disk. So in general, if you have no radial motions, here you should see a symmetric blob. Here you can clearly see that there is more emission in these two quadrants with respect to these two other quadrants. And this is the typical effect of radial motions. In fact, our model in red can nicely reproduce this asymmetry. So on top of the rotation curve, we can also measure the radial inflow rate at each radius. So this is consistent with zero in the other parts, but then steadily increase towards the center. And we can tell it's an inflow because we know the near side of the disk from the dust distribution. So the next step is to perform a full dynamical modeling, but here there is a complication which essentially occurs every time you have a very bright AGN, which is that in the center, the luminosity is dominated by the AGN. It doesn't trace the stellar mass. So if you want to compute the potential, you have to take off uh, the inner light component driven by the AGN, in this case also by the starburst. Next, you can do a classic uh, rotation curve decomposition. So you can see that the stars essentially dominates the dynamics within one and a half uh, kiloparsecs. But in the very central regions, we need a black hole. Now, with this type of modeling, we can also measure roughly the gas mass. And so if we know the gas mass at each radius, we can quantify the gas inflow rate, which is essentially the gas mass times the radial velocity divided by r. And we find that it's around zero in the other parts, and then in the center, it increases and is of the order of a few uh, solar masses per year. Finally, we can look at the black hole mass stellar mass relation. This is, of course, the final goal of the Wisdom Survey. This is just a preliminary investigation. 
The black dots are data from Sao et al, from the literature, mostly using ionized gas, kinematics, and stellar kinematics, and you can see that the errors on the black hole mass are substantial. For the wisdom galaxies, in red, essentially the errors are as large as, as the dot. Um, down here is NGC 404, the dwarf galaxy that essentially extends the relation by one deck in black hole mass. And this is Firal 49, which is on the relation within the scatter. So before concluding, let me promote this uh, code called bias line fit, which is a MCMC tool to fit a line through data, but taking into account errors on both axes as well as intrinsic scatter in the, rela in the relation. So if you need to fit a line through data, you can go on this website and download the code, which is very easy to use. So to conclude, what can CO Dynamics do for you? We can measure black hole masses uh, in both late type galaxies and early type galaxies with typical accuracy of 10 to 20 percent. We can also measure black hole masses in the nearest dwarf galaxies. In the case of NGC 404, we find a black hole mass of the order of 5 times 10 to the 5 solar masses. And finally, we can identify and measure radial gas inflows. And in the case of Fire 49, we estimate a gas inflow rate of the order of a few solar masses per year. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Federico. We already have a, a question from Marcella. Thank you, Federico. Very, very nice. Um, I miss uh, uh, of uh, all your sources how many AGN are in your sample. All of them have... Uh, no, no, not all of them. So, Farrell 49 for sure. So, the sample was selected for galaxies in which we can um, resolve the sphere of winds who have influence of the black hole. So, there is no type of AGN selection. I don't remember by art what is the percentage of AGNs, uh, but you know. No, I may probably ask Hilaria, yeah, probably. 30, 30%, <laughs> uh, and you can ask yeah. Hilaria. And, uh, and <laughs> oh, yes. So, it depends on who you talk. Um, okay. <laughs> so, the galaxy has um, compact radio emission in the center, which okay. is extended over 15 parsec. And it has been interpreted as radio, compact radio jets. Um, it also has a bright uh, X-ray source in the center, which Makes could sense. be due to an AGN. And the optical emission lines are typical of a liner. Okay. So it could be a bit of everything. But let's say if you take everything together, you may say that there is a weak AGN in the center. OK, thanks a lot. So first, uh, just a quick comment. I think that. Probably the part in the um, stellar mass, black hole mass diagram will be populated by similar objects uh, in the next coming years, which I think it's amazing to try to measure low mass black holes in that, uh, in that portion. So I guess the program will go on and there will, there will be many other programs, so I'm really waiting to see what, what's happening. But I have just a curiosity on the uh, dwarf galaxy. So what are the mass and the density of the gas disk uh, that the you density measure. of the gas so disk the mass uh, is of the order of measure. So the mass is of the order of 10 to the 7 uh, solar masses. And the densities are, you know, you there is of course a profile, but it's typical for molecular gas. So of the order of 50 solar masses per parsec square, something like that. Ah, OK. Uh, the, the volume density? Uh, the volume I'll, density. I'll check the size. It's fine. I need to calculate. I don't know. <laughs> But it depends on the thickness that you see yes, yes, from yes. the disk. Thanks. Well, thanks, Federico. <laughs> we go on uh, with uh, Quirino D'Amato. We go back to protoclusters at high redshift. Just a second to load uh, the presentation. Scanning for signal. Echo. You. Non so che sono in contatto, ma...
point. Still green. I have a green coat. <laughs> so so. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Quirino D'Amato, I just started my first uh, postdoc uh, uh, at CISA and it's good to see your faces after almost an entire PhD spent on Zoom, so thanks to the organizers to let me talk today here. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, so, uh, large scale today I'm going to talk about uh, large scale AGM feedback and in feedback particular used by uh, an IZ radio galaxy at the center of a protocluster redshift uh, 1.7 and uh, nothing. Uh, because I have green contours, so <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> On yellow maps. Oh, Cammino. <laughs> okay. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, I will talk about the role of uh, um, the, an AGN, a powerful a high radio galaxy uh, located uh, at the center of a protocluster, a redshift 1.7, in uh, heating the surrounding medium and possibly triggering star, for star formation uh, in nearby galaxies. Um, so, okay. Um, so, in this uh, Schematic cartoon, you can see the main stages of uh, galaxy evolution within uh, large scale structures, which uh, uh, galaxies uh, grow uh, fed by um, streams of cold gas, and then the ignition of the AGN starts to affect the uh, interstellar medium, le leading to the quenching of the star formation. Uh, in the local universe, uh, of course, this is a very schematic view and. Uh, uh, as shown by Ivan today, the situation is way much more complicated than that. But what I want to stress is that uh, when we talk about uh, AGM feedback, we mostly talk about it in terms of negative AGM feedback, uh, meaning uh, the role of the AGN in quenching the star formation and uh, uh, on the scales of the host galaxies. But we know that uh, um, the AGM feedback can extend uh, 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 on megaparsecs, on megaparsec parsec scales, uh, way uh, beyond uh, the scales of the host galaxies, uh, 
uh, as uh, visible in this uh, high Z radio galaxy, in this uh, very famous image in which we observe a depression of the X-ray emission arising from the hot gas uh, in the presence of the radio jets and also in this uh, uh, very beautiful image uh, recently published by Marisa Brienza uh, showing that the radio jets uh, uh, feature features a, a buoyancy morphology uh, that can be ascribed to interaction with the surrounding medium. And this has important consequence uh, for the overall galaxy evolution in, the, in, the, uh, in large scale structures, uh, for example, uh, by preventing uh, the uh, in, uh, cooling of the gas in the central part of the clusters uh, and in turn preventing further star formation to occur. So it's interesting to investigate these uh, processes uh, also at high redshift when we know that most of the star formation occurs. Um, for example, at the so-called cosmic noon around the uh, redshift two. Um, so uh, indeed, we know that high Z radio galaxies uh, are known to be uh, ex excellent protocluster signposts because they are often found at the center of the spectral distribution of the member of clusters. In general, they show higher star formation rates, stellar mass, uh, and uh, um, uh, luminosity from the X-ray to the radio band that they also often found at the center of the spatial distribution and uh, uh, of the on the members in, uh, in distant protoclusters. And uh, otherwise than the lo their local counterparts, we know that uh, um, they uh, often are hosted by uh, gas-rich galaxies, uh, and this is true also for the, all the members of uh, high-Z radio, uh, high-Z uh, protoclusters. Uh, and in general, we also found uh, uh, diffuse uh, um, molecular gas component at the center of, uh, of protoclusters. And uh, in, the, in the presence of these high-Z radio galaxies, uh, uh, we uh, observe, uh, in some cases, uh, the X-ray emission arising from the hot gas so that is shock heated by the energy inflated by the uh, FR2. Um, and this is uh, a clear signature of uh, interaction uh, and the AGM feedback uh, on uh, scales of megaparsec. Um, so... So, as I said, uh, we uh, often talk about AGM feedback in terms of quenching of the star formation, but we are collecting uh, increasing uh, evidence uh, of uh, uh, positive AGM feedback. Uh, for example, uh, uh, we uh, observe in many cases uh, um, the presence of uh, uh, enhanced uh, ionized gas emission uh, uh, um, uh, that is uh, aligned with the radio jets uh, in uh, local and distant uh, radio galaxies. Uh, and this is thought to arise from uh, uh, star forming G regions that uh, are, uh, uh, arises from uh, the compression of the gas uh, uh, produced by the uh, jet that is proceeding outwards from the host galaxy. And uh, what is important is that uh, uh, all this uh, uh, um, observation regards uh, positive ATM feedback uh, produced within the host galaxy of the radio galaxies. Uh, but uh, we have very few examples, uh, and to my knowledge this is the only example, in which uh, the radio galaxy jet can uh, trigger the star formation uh, in uh, nearby galaxies, so in other galaxies than the, uh, the host galaxy of the FR2. And in this example of the Minkowski object, we see an answer H alpha emission uh, in a galaxy that is located uh, um, in the direction of the radio jets. So we don't know if uh, actually this is just a, a peculiar case due to the perfect alignment of the radio jet with the galaxy, or uh, this effect can uh, uh, enhance the star formation of multiple galaxies uh, uh, in distant protoclusters, and with, which is the incidence of this effect on the overall galaxy evolution uh, in distant clusters. So, uh, in order to uh, investigate this uh, process, uh, we need to uh, s mm, probe several mechanisms that uh, uh, emit uh, uh, in a wide range of frequencies. Uh, so, we need broadband observations on relatively rare objects. Uh, in this respect, uh, the, the J1030 field in a great laboratories, uh, laboratory to uh, perform such a studies because uh, it is centered around uh, a quasar redshift uh, 6.3, around which we 
recently uh, observed uh, an assembling uh, uh, structure of the forming galaxies and as such has been targeted by many observations from the X-ray to the radio band. And thanks to this observation, we uh, serendipitously uh, detected uh, uh, discovered uh, another rover density of star forming galaxies that are assembling around a powerful FR2 galaxy, uh, Redshift 1.7. Um, so, you can see here the HST image of the region around, of the, around the uh, radio galaxy. These are the 1.4 gigahertz uh, VLA, uh, 1.4 gigahertz observations. Uh, uh, performed with VLA in uh, 2003. And uh, you can see here uh, that uh, thanks to uh, Muse and Lucy observations, we uh, discovered seven star forming galaxies uh, around uh, the FR2. And thanks to deep uh, X ray observation that cover uh, uh, the J1030 field, uh, we also unveiled the presence of a diffuse X ray emission co spatial with the uh, radio galaxy. Uh, and you can see that, interestingly, uh, four of the star-forming galaxies are located at the edge of their X-ray emission. And these galaxies uh, show a uh, um, star formation rate that is higher than that, uh, the specific star formation rate that is higher than the, those uh, of the other members, discovered members of the structure. And in general, uh, they show a star formation rate that is higher than main sequence galaxies uh, of comparable stellar mass. Uh, so we propose that the X-ray emission arises from uh, um, uh, a bubble of expanding gas that is shock heated by the uh, uh, energy inflated by the X-ray, uh, the um, high Z radio galaxy uh, in, the, in the surrounding medium. And this subsequently uh, compresses the cold gas in these uh, galaxies, uh, uh, triggering the star formation. And if confirmed, this will be the first evidence of uh, high uh, of uh, AGM feedback on multiple galaxies uh, at uh, hundreds of kiloparsec scales. Uh, so we targeted this uh, region with uh, ALMA observations aiming at detecting uh, the CO2 uh, to 1 uh, uh, transition line. Uh, in order to investigate the gas content of uh, the structure and possibly unveil the presence of uh, um, um, gas -rich, uh, new gas-rich members. And we also uh, op uh, obtained a deep uh, JVLA observation of the entire uh, J1030 field, uh, thanks to which we uh, can investigate also the diffuse emission of the IZ radio galaxy. Um, so. So thanks to the ALMA observations, we uh, actually uh, detected three new gas-rich uh, members of the structure, A1, A2, and A3, uh, with a high, with a high uh, molecular gas reservoir uh, with a mass uh, of several 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses. And we also build the presence of a large gas reservoir around the, uh, the uh, FR2 host galaxy. We did not detect any emission from the previously known members. Uh, however, the high uh, three sigma per limit to the mass uh, uh, that is of several ten, uh, times 10 to the 10 solar masses uh, uh, do not rule out the presence of uh, large gas reservoirs also in these uh, uh, galaxies. So as I said, we uh, detected uh, uh, a strong emission uh, line from uh, the EOS galaxy of the FR2, uh, from which uh, we uh, de derived a, a molecular gas of uh, two times 10 to the 11 solar mass and distributed uh, on uh, uh, tens of kiloparsec scale uh, around the EOS galaxy, uh, beyond uh, the optical emission of the EOS galaxy, that is this one. And uh, uh, from the velocity map, we can also see a gradient uh, of the velocity of the gas velocity that is perpendicular to the radio jet. So this gas uh, is rotating uh, at least in projection uh, perpendicularly to, to the radio jet. Um, we also detected uh, the uh, emission, uh, uh, the continuum emission in the host galaxy uh, at three millimeters. And thanks to the uh, broadband coverage, uh, of the galaxy, uh, um, of the host galaxy, we can also perform the SED fitting, thanks to which uh, we derived a star formation rate of about 600 uh, 
solar masses per year around solar mass, uh, a stellar mass of about 410 to the 11 solar masses. So uh, the corresponding, as if we put the corresponding specific star formation rate of this plot uh, of the star formation rate as a function of the stellar mass uh, until that the, our galaxy is uh, in a starburst phase if compared to the star formation uh, of uh, 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 galaxy of main sequence galaxies, uh, a comparable redshift and comparable stellar mass. Uh, this uh, means that we coat this uh, interesting object uh, in its uh, brief phase uh, of most of the uh, its uh, stellar mass assembly, and uh, we did not. Uh, um, we also use a density fitting to investigate the nature of the emission observed at, uh, with Alma and that is probably dominated by thermal emission, dust thermal emission, even if uh, it's not uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, non-thermal uh, contribute cannot uh, completely rule it out. Um, so, uh, okay, so um, the, BC, the, the aperture galaxy is located at the center of the spatial distribution and it has a uh, uh, velocity of offset uh, of, uh, from the peak of the spectral distribution that is lower than the velocity dispersion and if uh, we um, um, consider uh, that this galaxy show a uh, higher uh, star formation rate and luminosity from all the other members, we can conclude that this is going to evolve into the future BCG. And uh, if we uh, um, uh, exploit this relation from uh, Berusi et al. From the, uh, between the stellar mass of the fusion BCG and the, uh, and the most massive uh, halo assembling around it, uh, we can derive a most massive halo of uh, about two times to 10 to the 13 solar masses. And if we put this uh, in this uh, uh, evolving uh, uh, plot uh, of in this uh, plot of the evolution of the most massive velocity well function of redshift, we see that this uh, structure is actually going to evolve uh, into a cluster of at least 10 to the 13 solar mass. We have obtained the same results if we consider the evolution of the overdensity. So, thanks to the uh, JVLA observation, that is uh, um, one of the deepest uh, JVLA observations uh, collected to date. Uh, uh, we uh, can uh, unveil uh, the presence uh, of more diffuse emission in both the lobes of the FR2 galaxy with respect to the previous observation in orange. And this uh, new uh, detected emission is cospatial with the, uh, for example, in the western lobe with the C thermal uh, X-ray emission. And uh, also uh, in the eastern lobe, we see that this nicely coincide, coincide, uh, coincide with the uh, X-ray emission, this strengthening the, po the hypothesis of uh, uh, AGM positive AGM feedback and uh, in heating the surrounding uh, medium and possibly also triggering uh, the star formation in nearby galaxies. Thank you. So we have time for a super quick question, if any. So no questions. I'm sorry, but we are running late. Uh, sorry no, again sorry. for our problems with the connection. So there is, I just call here the last speakers of this session. It is Sarah White from Rhodes University. I'm trying to put the presentation on. Where is it? Hi, ah, it's the first one. Too easy. Let's see if it works. I have to ask this other one. Okay. View full screen. Okay, so you already have the pointer. Let's see if it works. Okay, perfect. Yes, it's oh, okay. because it's okay. not, I mean, yeah. If you point at the laptop, it works. If you okay. point in another direction, it's very late, it's very slow. Okay, I need to go back one now. Okay. okay. Thanks. Uh, Bonjour, and grazie mille to the organizers for granting me a talk. Uh, mi chiamo Sarah White, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Rhodes University, funded by the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. And I thought I'd start with a quick advert for the IAU General Assembly, which will take place in Cape Town in 2024. 
So very much look forward to seeing you there either in person or online. But now for Il Secondo. Today I'll be talking about the brightest radio sources in the southern sky, so a compilation of nearly 2,000 radio, um, radio loud AGN, which we refer to as the Gleam Forjansky sample. Now just a quick overview of why we care about AGN. Both star formation and black hole accretion influence the way in which galaxies evolve. And we want to know, are there genuine mechanisms that connect those two processes? Uh, through due to there being a common reservoir of molecular gas that fuels both star formation and black hole accretion. Similarly, there's debate over the overall impact of radio jets. Do they suppress or actually trigger star formation in the host galaxy? And how does all of this tie in with the apparent co-evolution of the supermassive black hole with the velocity dispersion of the bulge? So there are so many AGN samples out there. Which ones should we use? Well, radio observations, to start with, allow us to create samples that are not affected by dust obscuration, which unfortunately is a, um, a limitation of optical surveys. In addition, if we do our selection at low radio frequencies, we can avoid um, what's known as an orientation bias, which happens at higher radio frequencies. And this comes about because of relativistic beaming, um, and so doing our selection at low frequencies allows us at least to mitigate that. Uh, we can also get better constraints of the broadband uh, radio spectrum. I'll come back to a few examples of those later. And finally, bearing in mind that at, as radio emission ages, it moves to lower frequencies. So by doing our selection there, we actually create a more complete sample in terms of the different AGN lifetimes and different duty cycles. And we want to do this because in order to uh, study the different timescales over which an AGN interacts with its host galaxy and surroundings. So for our work, we've used the GLEAM survey, which is a low frequency survey of the entire southern sky up to a declination of plus 30 degrees. And this was conducted using the Murchison Wide Field Array, which is in Western Australia, a precursor a telescope for this um, square kilometer array, the low frequency component. And for our sample, we've uh, selected all of the sources that are brighter than four Jansky at 151 megahertz. And here we have a histogram of their radio brightness. So the sources to the right of this vertical line are the types of sources we already know and love thanks to the famous 3CRR sample of the Northern Hemisphere. But with the Gleam Forjansky sample, we have something that is 10 times larger. And that's important if we want to investigate the properties of these radio loud AGN as a function of redshift and environment as well. And to do so, uh, we need this larger sample so we can also uh, develop more robust statistics for testing against models and simulations. Now, another um, uh, strength of the NWA the Merton Wide Field Array, is that it has excellent spectral coverage at low frequencies. We have 20 individual flux density measurements between 70 and 230 megahertz, and that gives us a very nice constraint on the low frequency end of the radio spectrum. So here we can see uh, this spectrum is dominated at low frequencies um, by the emission from the lobes, so the red and blue data points here, whereas the radio core uh, has this nice flat spectral shape shown by the green data points. And overall, we have this total spectrum, which is steep at low frequencies and flattens out to high frequencies. So quite a nice um, spectral signature of a restarted AGN. Also, to note for this particular source by Hernandez uh, Garcia et al., they find that the, the, old, the lobes are actually connected to old radio emission, of course, but more recently, this appears to be a blazar. So the radio jet has actually changed its direction as it's now more aligned uh, with our line of sight. Now we've extended this uh, spectral analysis for the whole Gleam Forjansky sample. So this is what we see just within the Gleam band. Uh, there's a one-to-one -one relation here showed by the uh, dotted line. So th that spectral signature of maybe a uh, restarted AGN uh, taking on this kind of concave shape shown in the top left of this plot, 
Whereas you may be more familiar with radio spectra also having this kind of uh, spectral curvature. And that's very useful if you want to use spectral aging models to calculate, well, how old is the radio emission associated with the AGN? So the idea is to com co um, compare these observed radio galaxies to simulations, um, particularly by Ross Turner. And note that we have some uh, new VLA data coming in uh, to try and quantify, well, what is the fraction of this complete radio loud AGN sample? What fraction um, are actually remnants? And so, again, get a better idea of the life cycle, the lifespans um, across the, these sources. Uh, we've extended this further still to higher frequencies, up to 20 gigahertz, by using new observations from the Australia Telescope Compact Array. And here's just a few examples just to illustrate how non-power law the synchrotron radiation may be. So that is the case for uh, three quarters of this subset. Again, we have this concave shape, uh, which appears to coincide with mostly blazars. That's an interesting subset of the gleam forjansky sample, um, particularly if you're interested in uh, multi-messenger astronomy, given the detection of neutrino emission from Texas 0506. There's also 16% of this subset uh, showing peak spectrum, uh, peak radio spectra, uh, so an indication that these may be young radio galaxies. And intriguingly, because of the contiguous coverage provided by GLEAM, we have a few sources with an interesting uh, kink in the radio spectrum. Now note that we originally thought, well, maybe there are just two unrelated radio galaxies that have been blended together by the MWA beam, but when we follow this up with Meerkat, we find that this source remains unresolved. And so it might be that we just need higher resolution than seven arc seconds, um, or it could be that we have multiple epochs of AGN activity which are superimposing one another. Now, in addition to the VLA follow-up, we also have Meerkat follow-up for 140 of these sources. And notes, uh, there's actually this, uh, range actually goes from 4 Jansky all the way up to 45 Jansky. This is just to give an indication of how little we actually know about some of the brightest sources in the southern sky. And the reason we follow up this subset is because they have particularly unusual radio morphologies and perhaps asymmetric structure, but also because the mid infrared sources are particularly dense. So we want to make sure that we're actually identifying the correct host galaxy which is, of course, crucial if we want to cross-match uh, radio catalogs and the, all of that radio data with information at other wavelengths. So one of my favorite images from the Meerkat telescope, um, as shown by the purple contours here, is for this Z-shaped radio galaxy. These are, uh, for our follow-up, we've had just five minute snapshots across each of the sources. And we still get these amazing images, um, very sensitive, um, lot good sensitivity to the diffuse emission, and also over 1.5 square, um, 1.5 degrees across um, as a field of view. But concentrating on the gleam forjansky source at the center, uh, what's going on here with this helical uh, structure? So the idea in this case is that maybe we have a precession where there's some external torque acting on the supermassive black hole at the center, causing the radio jet axis um, to be perturbed. And that carves out this very nice helical structure as shown here. So this image is actually an image from the VLA and is for an X-ray binary called SS433. I just wanted to put it up there to illustrate how nicely the accretion physics um, this phenomena uh, applies both for supermassive black holes and for stellar mass black holes. And also as part of this work, we wanted to do a, um, a check of, well, how, how far away are the true host galaxy positions from the radio brightness centroid? So for the cold gleam Forjansky sample where we have existing identifications, those are the red data points, for the meerkat subset, those are the blue data points. And uh, just to note for this scale, we, it's within this black box, it's a linear scale, and then beyond it, it goes into a log scale. So just looking at the numbers along here, we can see, well, as we'd expect, for a, so for a subset that has been uh, biased towards the, a more unusual 
uh, enigmatic glean fordansky sources, um, it's unsurprising that we have a much larger offset from the host galaxy in the center of the radio brightness. So again, that's to illustrate how difficult it can be to actually do that first step of making sure you have the right host galaxy for your complicated uh, radio sources. And coming towards the end of the talk now, um, additional follow-up using the Southern African Large Telescope. And this is to um, put together the optical spectroscopy we need because, of course, we need those red shifts in order to calculate intrinsic properties. So note that the existing uh, survey over the entire southern sky is really the six-degree field galaxy survey. But with our ongoing multi-semester campaign, uh, we're able to go four orders of magnitude deeper. And here are a few examples where we have uh, Radio Loud AGN showing very nice clean emission lines, some showing, showing nice absorption lines, and of course, a mixture of the two. And to conclude, Please do go check out the two uh, Glean Forjansky papers that are already um, available. Here is the GitHub repository for uh, details on how to access the catalog and all of the images associated with this sample. A reminder that by selecting at low radio frequencies, we can uh, create AGN samples that are independent of the orientation of the radio jet axis. And a reminder that these are all in the southern sky, so we can observe them with both Alma and Meerkat. Thank you for listening. Thanks, uh, Sara. Any questions? There's a question down there. Thank you. Yep, that's working. Cool. So. With the, you mentioned there might be some like external torque causing the um, like spiral helical pattern. Um, do you have any idea what that might be? Uh, so one idea is that, um, well, it's not, it's been in the literature for quite a while, the idea that, that you've actually got two supermassive black holes that are orbiting one another. So you know, it needs to be massive enough that it's going to have uh, such a, an impact on the main supermassive black hole. So yeah, uh, it, an alternative is that maybe there was some inflow, massive inflow of gas that's also disrupted uh, the accretion disk system, and maybe that's you know, causing it to wobble as well. But I think you, know, you need to look at the, you know, the relative uh, masses involved. Thank you. What about the 90 degrees changing in the Do you have any information? Yeah, I'd have to go back to um, Hernandez Garcia et al's paper for that. Thank you. I have a question from the audience. Not here, so let's thank Sarah again. <laughs> so thanks again to all the speakers of today. It was really interesting, and it's nice to see faces live again and also see that the AGN conference series is uh, attracting people from other countries, so that's really good. So see you all tomorrow at 9 o'clock for the morning, morning session of tomorrow. Any other advertisement? Um, okay, have a good night and enjoy your evening. <laughs>